So we're going to be in here tonight and sing, and my kids are like, they don't even realize that all y'all are on live. They're just kind of, they're doing their thing because I want them to come sing, so I don't know what my son is doing. So, hey. I know you guys are all there. I don't care. Welcome to Monday night. Say hey to everybody. Hey, everybody. This is Charlie. This is Mac. And we're going to sing a song for y'all. I didn't even have to twist their arm or, or they didn't get mad at me or anything. That was awesome. So we're going to sing a song for y'all tonight. We've done all kinds of music on this um, live every Monday night. We've gone anywhere from Kirk Franklin to um, People in Songs to Brooklyn Tabernacle to everything in between. And we are going to sing tonight for y'all a Southern Gospel song. <laughs> Some of you are... Southern Gospel fans, and y'all are going to be like, woohoo, and some of you are going to be like, Southern Gospel, what is that exactly? So, it's just another style of music, praising Jesus, so that's what we're going to do. We're good. They just keep y'all, up. they don't understand that we need to all leave it alone, right? Okay. Well, we're, we're fixing it. We're going to, excuse them. Sorry. Lives have technical difficulties. Thank y'all for putting up with us. Okay, don't so stop. we're going to sing you for you. I don't want to sit down. I like to sit okay, down. Okay, well, you want to be Yeah, it's going to be fine. So, we're going to sing. All right. Nice. Go start. Oh, here we go.
<laughs> now I've got to get them out of here because they'll just keep picking and playing like y'all ain't even on here, so <laughs> kick them out. <laughs> All right, we're out. Bye. Oh, oh let's close that door. Would you do that for me? Yeah. Thank y'all for putting up with that. Thank you for putting up with them. And their goodness, yes, they're so sweet. I love my boys so much. <laughs> and they didn't fuss with me about coming on tonight. I was so excited. I didn't even have to twist any arms or threaten to, you know, chop off limbs or anything. That was awesome. And so I'm going to talk to you guys in here tonight in my bathroom with all these distractions that are going on. I'm going to let my dog out because he's wanting out. A distracted night. You know what? Whew. I know a man who can. He can calm all this down and he can bring it back down. So if um, you are one of those people that doesn't like these lives when they get on and we're just being kind of crazy and having a good time, you can go back and replay and you can fast forward through all of that. You don't have to listen to it. <laughs> oh, I wish we could sing it again, Jenny. Woohoo! <laughs> Getting all that back in here would be a little bit crazy. Well, welcome to Monday nights, ladies. Welcome, welcome. I'm so excited to be in here with you guys tonight. I'm so excited to see all your lovely names flowing up and all that wonderful stuff. Um, so good to be in here with you guys tonight. I gotta get my brain back down again. Whew. I'm so used to only managing me and my thoughts and not having to manage my teenage boys in and out. So <sighs> relax, take a deep breath. It's all good. Everything's good. So. I wanted to just say two quick things because Melissa and Jenny are going to take over all the admin stuff, but I did want to share this with you guys. If you have not shared a 30 second video with us, we talked about it last week. Um, we would love to do, we're going to do a promo video and we would love to have some of you ladies share a 30 second video with us. Just a 30 second video. If you go a little over, that's okay. We'll shave it off. Send it to gmrppw at gmail.com and tell us your name and one thing that the Glorious Marriage Revolution has meant to you. We've got a few of them in already and they are just precious and it just touches our hearts to hear you ladies, to see your faces, to hear your voice and to hear what God has done in your life through this ministry and I'm so excited to get more. We want more. So send us your videos um, and check out our website. I don't know if y'all have seen that our website is up and running. We've tweaked a few things, added a few extra pictures that we didn't have before and you can find it at either gmrministries.com or gloriousmarriagerevolution.com. So either of those places will take you right to us and of course the Eventbrite link for the conference is on there. So. Tonight, there's a couple, y'all really, the Lord just, my brain has just been going, going, going. The Lord's just been working in my heart and in my mind, and I've been trying so hard to pull all my thoughts together, and, um, oh, there's just so much that I want to say tonight. So, um, let's pray. We're going to talk about our chapter. We're going to talk about his health. The assignments will be coming to you tomorrow probably because I was not able to get them all together and put into a format for Hannah to get to you. So it's my fault. So we will do that tomorrow. Okay, so let's pray real quick and then we're going to get started on this night. Okay, let's pray. Whew. Father, in the name of Jesus, I come to you right now just giving you my thoughts, giving you my mind calming myself down lord thanking you that you are a god who can take care of all of our problems there's no one person on this earth that can give us the answers to our problems but you are a god who can and lord i pray that tonight you would use me as your vessel use my mouth lord jesus there's nothing i can say that will help anybody but holy spirit if you will be our teacher we will learn and we will be able, be able to apply this to our lives after this video. We love you. We praise you. We give you all the glory. It's all about you, Lord, in your mighty name. Amen and amen. Amen. Okay. Let's talk about chapter 11. His health. Okay. Um, as I started to get ready to prepare for today, and listen, let me tell you something. Monday nights is a preparation that starts 
from the time I get up all the way till I get on here because my mind just goes from one thing to the next to the next to the next and the Lord puts these little pieces, these links together of what he wants shared on Monday nights. And so it is um, it is an all-day preparation thing for me. And um, as the Lord began to work in my mind this morning, two of my devo devotions talked about faith. We're going to try to weave that in here just tonight a little bit into our chapter because she talks about that. Um, we're going to talk about faith and how the Lord wove that in before I really even started to fully prepared tonight. He started preparing me about faith tonight. Okay, so talking about his health, the chapter starts out with her talking about her husband uh, not really ever having much of a desire to take care of his health or to exercise or to eat right and that she would continually put it before him and he just would like glaze over and uh, you know I don't want to hear that kind of stuff and then she thought well I'm gonna take and apply the same shut up and pray method that I've done with everything else in his life and I'm just gonna shut up and pray and before she knew it he was up on the treadmill one day and he's been doing it ever since and he's been exercising three days a week lifting weights doing this stuff strength training eating better He's been doing it ever since. Now, as I'm reading this chapter, for me, the application for me in my life was a little different. <laughs> and here's why. <laughs> here's where all and uh, most of my friends and family are probably laughing right about now because they know what I'm about to say. Um, as we know, all these chapters somehow always come back to us. Right? It just always does. Well, this one just smacked me right square in the face because um, the roles are reversed in this chapter for us. Mm -hmm. My hubby is an avid, avid, avid worker outer, has been his whole life. His dad, Hannah, bless you. She's got the same thing going on in her world. Little Hanny, oh, bless her. Her husband and my husband, they just carved out of the same stuff. Anyways, so Brian's dad was a military, career military guy. He ran, he worked out, he was constantly in it, you know, and, and he ingrained it into Brian because Brian saw his daddy doing it. His dad always ate very well, still does. He's 83 years old. Um, he is just trim, fit. He can still do pull-ups from a bar. Y'all, I'm not kidding. He can do ab stuff. I mean, up until just, you know, my kids, when my kids were small, you know, he was 60, 70 years old or whatever at the time when they were younger and smaller. He would do push-ups with them on his back. Yeah. So, I mean, he's just always been that way. And so, hence, his son is that way. And he's always been that way. And he has always run. He's always lifted weights. He's always been careful about what he eats. Um, and I, I don't eat bad. It's not that. It's just that I don't really like exercise. So let's just all lay it out and be real tonight. I'm not going to act like I got that part of my life together because I don't. I do not like to exercise. And it's like my mama just said, I'm a little allergic to it. I don't like it. <laughs> so probably Brian could teach this chapter better than I could teach this chapter because I'm sure that he's been praying for me for the last 27 years that I would get the want to to exercise. Come and gone with it. I've gone here and there and all over the place with it. I have. I actually taught uh, an aerobics class at my church years ago. I, I was part of um, this little group called Body and Soul Aerobics, and we did aerobics to um, Christian music. And I actually went to a, a, a conference thing in Maryland and got taught all this stuff about teaching aerobics and I came back and brought it to my church and I taught aerobics and I was all Miss Bouncy and woohoo and I still I, I do still enjoy fun stuff like that however I just don't choose to get up and do it every day so anyway um on to the next thing I'm not real good about all that but anyways as she's talking about praying for our husband's health it isn't just about exercise it yes we do all need to take care of the temple God has given us I say all that to be funny and I'm, I'm, I'm not making light of the fact that we really do need to take care of our bodies and the older I get the more I'm aware of that because I just was never in a place in my life where I really had to think about it earlier on in my life I was always skinny as a little toothpick and never really thought about it um, but as you get older 
you know, things start to happen. And so, you know, when other people tell you, you just wait till you get older, you just wait. And yeah, they weren't lying about that. So anyway, I have had to think about that in the last couple of years and it's, it's harder now than it used to be. Um, but it isn't just about the fact that we need to be taking care of ourselves, eating right and exercising. Yes, we do because we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And this is the body that God created for us to be here on this planet. And we need to take the best care of it that we absolutely can. So I, I get that. I really, really do. So I'm making light of myself. I'm making fun of myself. But the truth of the matter is, is we really do need to take care of ourselves and um, we want to be the best we can be for the Lord while we're here and that means the best physical condition we can be in as well because we can't live to our fullest if we're sick all the time and um, when our bodies are healthy and we're exercising we do just can do better for him we can think more clearly so all that to say to bring it back down to the chapter it, it could be more than just you just wish your husband would exercise it could be like some of you I know on here for, names are popping into my head right now of your husbands who are very very sick um, <clears throat> he's been in and out of the hospital I know there's more than a handful of you that are coming into my mind right now that your husbands have been very very sick and you're dealing with a lot of of things um, in your world. Um, okay, Trisha just called me out uh, about the planking thing. Yeah, sometimes I am. I'm just being real. <laughs> and I have started yoga with my husband, so I'm kind of alternating between the two. So if I had to say, do I get up just raring to go and do all this every day? Nah, not so much. So I'm just real, y'all. And I just, I. So, I don't know about that whole thing about me and Melissa getting up and planking on the stage at the, mm -mm, y'all, that ain't gonna happen. Okay? Okay. But, I do still want to do it. I do still want to plank and I do still want to yoga. Back to the point. All right. So, some of you and your husbands are really, really sick. And she talks about on, oh, well, your page may be different, but she says, um, your husband's health is not something to take for granted and neither is ours. Okay, I'm back, back to being serious. No matter what his age or condition or ours, um, we need to pray for him to learn to take proper care of himself. And if he becomes ill, pray for him to be healed. And this, this goes back to us too. Pray that we'll have a desire to exercise and to eat right and to do right um, and to take care of ourselves for our men and for them to do it for us as well. She says here, I've seen too many answers to prayers for healing in my life and the lives of others to doubt that the God who healed in the Bible is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that is so very true. She says, I believe that when God said, I am the Lord who heals you, he meant it. Amen. So do I. So do I. Then she says, I have the same faith as Jeremiah who prayed, Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. I trust his word when it promises, I will restore health to you and heal you of your wounds. All of those scriptures are listed in the chapter. Go back and look those over. Then she says here, Jesus took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. He gave his disciples power to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. These signs will follow those who believe, that they will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. It seems to me that God is interested in healing and he didn't put a time limit on it, only a faith limit. Now, let me say this. She really goes into it better. Let me, let me read what she says, and then I'm going to go into what the Lord told me later. She says, remember, however, that even though we pray and we have faith, listen very closely to this, ladies. The outcome and the timing are God's decision. He says that there's a time to heal. That's from Ecclesiastes chapter 3. There's a time to heal. If you pray for healing and nothing happens, don't beat yourself up for it. This is something we really have to think about because some people will pray and pray and pray and pray for healing over a situation and God doesn't heal the way they expect and they 
their loved one is called home. That's, that's a different kind. That is the ultimate healing. That is God still. He is still answering prayer. He's answering it his way. And I know that's hard to take. So we have to be very, very careful that we don't pray uh, thinking and, and when things don't change the way we think they ought to, that we haven't prayed with enough faith. Let's be very, very careful with that. So there's this fine line there. God can still call someone home. That is, that is the ultimate healing. I mean, people who have already gone on to glory, they are far, far, far better off than we are. They are no longer sick. They are no longer crippled. They no longer need oxygen tanks. They no longer need, you know, medicine. They don't need doctors anymore. They don't need chemo anymore. They are completely whole and well. That is the ultimate healing. It's just hard for us on this side when they, when they have to leave us. It says here, God sometimes uses a man's physical ailments to get his attention so he can speak to him. Um, I, th I think it was last week. Uh, did I talk about I know I talked about Shabbat in um, the Sabbath rest in Sunday school. Um, but the Sabbath rest is uh, something that the Lord commanded back in the Old Testament. And he, he says the actual word for Sabbath, meaning you know a rest, taking a break, taking a pause. Um, the actual word in Hebrew is Shabbat. And not only does it mean rest, to, to cease from labor, um, it also means to make to fail or to make to rest. Sometimes when the Lord needs to get our attention and we continue to refuse to heed his voice, he will make us rest to get our attention. Um, and maybe your man is in that place. Maybe he's in a place of rebelling against the Lord. Maybe he's just not listening because he's too, he's not rebelling against the Lord, but he's just not listening because there's too many distractions coming in at him. And we can say the same thing for ourselves. Too many distractions that get in the way, too many um, emails to answer, too many Facebook me messages to answer, too much scrolling up the news feed, or too much this or that or the other, too many TV shows we're addicted to, too many things, and the Lord has to get our attention. It makes me think of when my kids were smaller, and I had to say they're smaller. I mean, I still even have to do it today. I call their name one time, and they're so engrossed in what they're doing. They're so distracted. Their mind's so distracted that I have to. I would have to say their name again and again and again, and then I would have to just go get right in front of them and touch them and say, listen to me, listen to me. And sometimes the Lord has to get right in front of us. And the only way he can do that is to knock us flat of our backs. So, if that's where you are, or if that's where your husband is, be mindful of the fact that if the Lord's doing that, he's doing it out of love and discipline. Discipline is not fun. It says over in Hebrews, when a child is, is disciplined by their father, it usually hurts. <laughs> and it is not fun, but it is beneficial for the harvest that is to come, for what God wants to do in our life after the discipline. When he finally gets our attention and causes us to listen to him, he's got something good on the other side of that discipline. So if that's you or if that's your husband or if that's both of you, hang in there. Hang in there and submit to him. Um, she says, keep praying, okay? In whatever situation your husband's health is in, keep praying because God's decision is the bottom line. The same is true when you're praying that God will save someone's life. We just talked about that. There's a time to die, and that is also in Ecclesiastes 3. There's a time to live, and there's a time to die. There's a time to heal. Um, and there's a time that he calls people home. So um, we just need to be very, very mindful of that. I want you to be sure. This chapter is, again, short. A lot of these chapters are very, very short. But I'm going to tie in just a few extra things here. Um, read the chapter prayer at the end. It's so, so good. I hope you're not skipping those. Um, you know, sometimes we get, we, we forget how to pray. We get so consumed with what's going on around us and we go to pray, we just can't think clearly um, to how, how to pray for our men. Remember when I first started out with this book study, I said, this is so important 
Use it as a guide with your Bible. Use it and ask the Lord, where do you want me to pray for my man? Like, what areas of prayer does my husband need prayer in? And then you go back and pray. Some of you have sent me messages uh, just in the last couple of days about, you know, things with your husband's work or this or that is happening. And I'm like, hey, you know, go back, go back to that chapter. Don't forget about that chapter. We talked about that. Go back and pray uh, through that. Um, doesn't mean you got to read the whole chapter again. Just go back to that prayer and say, Lord, use this as my prayer. Help me, Lord. I can't, I can't have all the, the words. I don't have all the words, but I'm going to use this. It's from my heart. So that's what we need to do is utilize this. Now, there's a scripture. She always gives the power tools at the back of the chapter. Um, there's a scripture that um, I'm going to kind of tie in something from my Sunday school class yesterday. Um, it was, and I just wanted to say, I had one of our 11,000 girls come to my Sunday school class yesterday, Jessica Thaxton. Oh, it was so great to see you and your man and to meet you guys. Um, if any of y'all live in our area and you want to come in and come into my Sunday school class and meet me and hug my neck, would you please do it? Would you please come and meet me? Um, I just would love to wrap my arms around you and to hug you, um, to have you in my class. Oh my gosh, how amazing would that be? Um, some of you have even asked if we could do like a live through live stream of my class. I would love that if the Lord worked out a way for us to do it. Um, we have, we're in concrete walls, so it kind of is like, yuck. But if the Lord ever opened that up, I would totally, totally do that. Um, if you guys, you know, we'll pray. We can pray. Whatever the Lord's got. And if he wants to, to open that door, we will walk through it. Okay, so one of the verses at, in the power tools at the end of the chapter was Psalm 103. And when I, I know Psalm 103 pretty well, but I went back and I looked at it, and I'm using the Amplified Bible tonight, okay? I told y'all, a lot of times I, I hop around and I use different translations, and um, tonight I'm in the Amplified Bible. And sometimes, man, the Amplified Bible is just amazing. <laughs> it's just amazing, and it just puts things in such a vivid way. Um, it's just amazing. It's amazing. So... If someone who's one of my peeps would please answer, I believe it was Amy, somebody, I'm sorry I missed your name, where we go to church. If you would put that in the comments, I would love you forever. Okay, so um, Psalm 103, and it was verses 2 and 3, but we're going to start from the beginning. It says, blessed, no, bless, affectionately, gratefully praise the Lord. Bless the Lord. That's how it says, talks about it in the Amplified. Oh, my soul, and all that is deepest within me, bless his holy name. Bless, affectionately, gratefully, praise the Lord, oh, my soul, and forget not one of all his benefits, who forgives every one of all your iniquities, who heals each one of all your diseases. Who redeems your life from the pit and corruption. Who beautifies, dignifies, and crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercy. Oh my goodness, that was the, oh. So, okay, here's where we're headed with this. If you were in my Sunday school class on Sunday, you're going to know exactly where I'm going with this. Because it says, who redeems your life from the pit. Can I just tell you, I know that many of you are in a pit. Because your marriage is in a pit. When your marriage is in a pit, you're in a pit. Okay? Sometimes, you just walked right off into the pit all by yourself. Sometimes... You got kicked off into the pit because someone else's choices, like we talked about last week, choices. Sometimes they were of your, not of your own making. Sometimes they were of your own making. Sometimes you had a lot to do with it. Choices, oftentimes, there's something that I have heard my mom and dad say through all the years that I've been grow that I grew up in their home and even outside their home where 
marriages would be crumbling, things would be falling apart, mom and dad would always say, there's always two sides to every story. Everybody has a part to play in destruction. There was somewhere along the way, if you backpedal back and you look back and see the little things that all lined up to make those wrecked choices happen, what went wrong somewhere? What could have been happening that you could have done differently. I'm not saying that some of the choices that your husband made that were really destructive was of your making. I'm not saying that. But somewhere along the way, it was a slow fade. Do you see where I'm going? Don't get offended at me and don't get mad. Hear me out. It's a slow fade. Because somewhere in your past, you truly loved each other and you truly fell in love with each other, you wouldn't walk down the aisle and said, I do. You wouldn't have gotten married. You wouldn't have picked him. Somewhere along the way, that faded. Where did it fade? What happened? Go back and find what happened and begin to pray from that place. Pray from that place. And find out what God wants you to do to change you first. We talked about that in the very first chapter. We got to keep going back to that because honestly, it always comes back to us somehow that we've got to. I don't want to say this and make it sound like it's our fault because it's not our fault. We got to take care of us. We've got to be accountable for us. We will not stand before the Lord one day and answer for our men. No matter how foul their choices were, we will not stand before the Lord and answer for them. We have to get ourselves right with the Lord, and then that begins to change the way we pray for our men. We've talked about that this whole entire time, okay? So here's where I want to go with this, the pits that we can find ourselves in sometimes. Um, she also uh, gave a scripture reference of 107 verses 19 and 20. So when I read the second one that was in the power tools, I was like, oh yeah, Lord, I know where we're going to go tonight. I get it. I see what you're doing here. Okay. So Psalm 107 verses um, 19 and 20, it says this, then they cry to the Lord in their trouble and he delivers them out of their distresses. He sends forth his word and heals them and rescues them from the pit and from destruction. Okay. Now go over with me to Psalm 40, okay? Psalm chapter 40. We're going to read the first five verses, and then I'm going to talk about the pit for just a minute, okay? We're not going to go quite as deep into it as we did yesterday in Sunday school, but we are going to go into it for just a minute. Let me get my notes back up here in just a second. Okay, I waited patiently and expectantly from the Lord. And he inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me out of a horrible pit, a pit of tumult and destruction, out of the miry clay, froth and slime. If you were in my class yesterday, you're grinning by now. And set my feet upon a rock, steadying my steps and establishing my goings. And he has put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many shall see and fear. They will revere and worship and put their trust and confident reliance in the Lord. Blessed, happy, fortunate to be envied is the man who makes the Lord his refuge and trust and turns not to the proud or to followers of false gods. Many, O Lord my God, are the wonderful works which you have done, and your thoughts toward us no one can compare with you. If I should declare and speak of them, they are too many to be numbered. All right, let's dig in. And Oops, sorry, I pulled my cord. Let's dig in and let's talk about this for just a second. So I'm going to turn my page over and go back to my notes for just a second. Okay, so the pit. When it says that the Lord inclined his ear to me, that means that he stretched forward. He bent forward to hear me. To hear me with intelligent attention. That's what the word heard means. 
He, le he leaned forward, he stretched forward to listen to that cry that you had of, Lord, I can't do this anymore. I'm so in a pit that I cannot get out. I cannot find my way out of this pit. Help me, Lord. And the Lord bent down to hear you and to help you. This horrible pit that is talked about in verse 2, this is what the word horrible means. It means a rushing uproar, a noise, a desolate place. The lies of the enemy. Does that sound familiar? When the enemy is so loud, he's, he's obnoxious. We've talked about this in past videos. He is obnoxious and the Holy Spirit is a gentleman. Whatever the Lord is, the enemy is the complete opposite. Our Lord is a gentleman. And he does not rush in and force us to do anything. He gives us a choice. But the enemy is loud and he wants to have his way. He's like a toddler who is throwing a fit on the floor of the grocery store. He's going to have his way. He's going to have his way and he's going to be loud. And he doesn't care because he wants all the attention on him. Right? Because he wants that toy or she wants that piece of candy or whatever it is. They want all the attention on them. They don't care how loud they are. That's how the enemy is. He's like a screaming little brat. And he's in your face and he's screaming, he's screaming, he's screaming because he wants all the attention and all the lies that go through our head and all we can think of is this is never going to change and that is never going to change and I wish he was different and I'm not good enough and I can't measure up and I'm, I'm too overweight and I never will look good enough and I, this and that and the other and we're never going to be over this financial hurdle and I wish this hadn't happened to me in my life and it's just a constant roar in your mind and you never can settle down and it's just this dark, awful place that's loud, but it's dry and it's desolate. The word for pit means a prison. A prison, that noise, all that that crazy, dry, uproarious sound is in your mind and you are in a prison. Then it says, but the Lord took me out of that pit. He rescued me out of that pit, out of the miry clay. And in the, in the Amplified, what it says right there, froth and slime, that's exactly what miry means. Miry gives this, what we think of miry clay, we think of mud and just kind of sludge. But it goes to another level. That word miry actually means effervescent. Gassy, fizzy, sludge. Think of just sulfur, stank. I mean, so, eh, Miss Pat, who's on here, she said it makes you like a porta potty. Yeah, I mean, stank. It stank. And that place is awful, and you can't get out of it. And the noise is so loud, and the smell is so wretched, and you're so sick of it, and you just want to be out of this place. Because it's awful. And you want to be rescued. And it says that he rescued out of me, this, me out of this place. Oh, that's the beautiful part. Is you don't have to stay in the pit. You cry out to the Lord. And it says right here, he listened to me. He inclined. He was attentive to me. He drew me out of this Stinky, frothy, bubbly, muddy, noisy, stinky place. And he set my foot upon a rock. Oh, hallelujah. That's the word to set means to actually to make everything clearer. To rise up and to help. To lift up again. To rouse up and to give strength. That's what that word set means. He set you up on a rock. That rock means a high and lofty place. This beautiful place. Up safe away from all the dangers in the valley. The Lord reached into that nasty stinky place. And he cleans you off. And he sets you up high up on a rock. So that nothing can get to you. He puts you in the cleft of his arm, in the cleft of his wing, under the shadow of his wing. And then it says here, he established my going. He established 
my going. The word established means to set up, to prepare, to appoint, to be certain. He is faithful. That's the next word in the definition of that. He's faithful and he has fashioned a plan for your life. He has fitted a plan for your life. So he takes you out of that nasty pit and he sets you up on a rock and he says, I have fashioned this beautiful plan for your life. And the next steps that you're about to take are going to be new and they're going to be different. I am doing a new thing because I have fashioned this beautiful plan for your life and it was never, ever, ever for you to be in that pit in the first place. Whether you dove off into it yourself or somebody kicked you off into it, it was never for you to be in that pit. My plans for you are good. My plans for you are this. The word going means steps. So he established your steps, but listen to this. It means to be straight to be level, to be happy, to prosper. That's what the word goings means. He's saying, I have fashioned this plan for you to be happy, for you to have this path that's level and straight and prosperous. It is my plan for you to be called blessed. Hallelujah. He has a plan for us to be blessed. He does not plan for us to stay in the stinky prison. He has plans to take us out and to set us on a new path. That word new means a fresh new thing. That's what it means. It means to completely rebuild. Oh, can I just tell you? That I don't care where your marriage is right now. I don't care how deep and dark and nasty it is right now. I don't care if your husband is walking a thousand miles away from Jesus and it doesn't seem like he's ever going to get saved. I am standing before you tonight and I declare to you that my God can do exceedingly abundantly above all that you can ask or think or imagine. He can do it all. If you don't feel like your husband is ever going to be saved, mm -mm, my God can. I know a man who can. That is something that I've said to so many of you in the messages you've sent me. Because when you send me your message and you tell me your story, I don't even know what to say. I'm so hurt for you. I hurt. I cry for you. I take your name before the throne of God and I ask him to fix these problems for you. And I automatically feel like I need an answer to give to you. But the, immediately the Holy Spirit reminds me, oh, Michelle, you don't have an answer for them. You tell them I can. So that is always my answer to you. And it is not because I'm trying to be trite or just give you some little answer because I don't know what else to say. That's what the Lord told me to tell you. I don't have the answers, but I know the one who does. I know a man, and his name is Jesus, and he can fix it all. Woo, glory. I'm, mm, mm, mm. Yes, holy dance, holy dance. Let me tell you something. My Jesus can do it. Whatever dark, deep, nasty place that you're in right now, my God can take you out of it. He can set your feet on a rock. He can put a new song of praise in your mouth. That song of praise means this. Get it now, girls. Get it. This, we're going to do some of this at the conference. It says to sing clearly, clearly, loudly, to shine, to boast. Get this. It means to be clamorously foolish. Being foolish and not caring what anybody else thinks about you and your praise. Not caring what the person sitting next to you in church thinks. Not caring what your family thinks. You're going to walk through the house. You're going to be praising the Lord. You're going to be singing. I know a man who can. I got an on time God. Yes, he is. I'm praising the Lord. Singing, dancing all over your house. Raising your hands. Clapping your hands. Stomping your feet. Telling the Lord you are good and you are faithful. Put on 
some people and songs and sing at the top of your lungs and just dance all over your house. Get you a song that you feel like you can dance to and give praise to the Lord. That's what that means. He took you out of a deep, dark place. He put you up on the rock. He put a new song of praise in your heart. You better sing that praise, sister. You better sing that praise back to the Holy Spirit. You better sing that praise back to the Father because he's the one that took you out of that pit. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You better sing that thing, girl. You better sing that thing. Mm, 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 mm. And it says, too, that his works are too wonderful. His thoughts toward us are not like any thoughts that anybody has ever thought toward us because he's not human. He is he is the everlasting God who created this universe. He doesn't have a beginning and he doesn't have an end. He is from everlasting to everlasting. He is eternal. And his thoughts towards us are not anything we could ever think because our thoughts are feeble at best. They are flawed at best. And he is wonderful and perfect in all of his ways. Let me tell you something. The enemy, I'm going to end it with this. The enemy has got such a hold on our minds in this world. And this is a revolution. I keep saying it. I'm going to keep bringing it back because listen to me, sisters. Listen to me. God wants to break the stronghold that we have over our minds that we're never going to get any better. Our husbands are never going to be saved. If they are saved and if they're in some deep, dark pit, they're never going to get out of it. Our marriages are never going to be healed. I just rebuke that in the name of Jesus. Satan, you have to leave because this is a revolution that our God has started. And our God is going to see it through. And our God is restoring marriages back to him. Hallelujah. Praise his holy name. And so we are not going to cower in fear. So what we've been doing here, and we've been learning... Okay, we've been learning how to pray. We've been learning how to fight. We've been learning to have a little bit of gusto in our prayer life, right? So get this. This is the, this is the most awesome, the awesomest thing ever. Okay, let me, let me get my thoughts together here. Faith. Let's go back to that before I end it with this bang because it's so cool. So faith. When we pray, we want to go to the Lord with faith. Okay, Hebrews. Ooh, let me go there real quick. Hebrews 11.1, 1, because I want to read it to you out of Amplified. It is so, so good. If you've got your Bible and you want to turn over there with me, Hebrews 11.1, 1, you know where I'm going. Um, but, oh my gosh, the way that the Amplified puts it is so good. All right, listen, as we're going forward and we're praying, we're believing God's getting us out of this pit, we are reaching up our arms as high as we can reach them. And we're saying, Lord, I need you to get me out of this pit. Get me, Lord, get me. It's like a little baby who's reaching up to its mama or its daddy. Pick me up. Pick me up. <sighs> reach up as high as you can. Don't you let the enemy tell you that he ain't coming. Mm. Don't, you, mm. Don't you do it. We're learning how to pray. We're building our faith. We're building our faith. And the enemy wants to tell us, oh, really? You think you're going to have faith? Really? He's taunting us. He's taunting us. Listen to me. It says in chapter 11, the first verse of Hebrews, Now faith is the assurance, the confirmation, the title deed of the things we hope for. Being the proof of things we do not see. And the conviction of their reality. Faith perceiving as real fact what is not revealed to the senses. What have we been saying this whole entire time? Pray like it's already done. Pray even though you don't see it happening yet, you pray and say, I have the faith, Lord, that you are healing my marriage. You are going to save my husband. You are going to fix this thing and get us out of this pit. You are. Even though I don't see it right now, Lord, even my eyes can't see it and I still smell the stink. I still smell it. I still feel that bubbly, effervescent, froth, nastiness that's all around me. But my God is coming to my rescue. Whew, I felt the breeze of the Holy Spirit right there. Hallelujah. You pray in faith like it's already done. That's what faith is. Now, faith is the assurance, the confirmation, the title deed of the things we hope for, being the proof of things we do not see. Mm, 
Hallelujah. Glory to God. You pray that way. And whenever the enemy tells you, you don't have the faith. Who do you, you really? You're really going to all of a sudden start praying against me and rebuking me? Who do you think you are? You don't have no power. I know you get all emotional or you might get a high when you get on the video with your, your glorious marriage revolution girls. And you might get a high when you go to church or whatever. But you come back, I know who you really are. Hmm. There's, a, there's a scene from The Lion King. And some of you may remember this. It's where Simba is, comes against the hyenas. The, hy the hyenas are chasing him, right? They're chasing after him. And he gets backed into a corner. So as he gets backed into a corner, he tries his lion roar, although he's still a cub. And so he doesn't have that lion roar just yet. And so he's real, he's trying really hard. The hyenas are just, they're starting to hover and they're, they're, they're closing in. You ever felt that way? The enemy's just closing in. And all of a sudden, the confidence that you had when you were in our group, when you're on this video, the confidence that you had after you left church and you heard this great sermon, this confidence that you had, all of a sudden you're like, yeah! And then you're shrinking back because you're, you're backed against a wall. And the hyenas are, of hell are starting to kind of close in. And they're taunting you and they're getting closer. And you roar a little bit and you're like, ah, I can do this. I, I, I can do this. And so the scene is Simba's doing that. He's backed against the wall. And he's like, like this. And then all of a sudden, whoa, here comes Mufasa. And his roar just shakes the cave. And the hyenas are cowering and they're scared to death because they know who Simba's dad is. And he has come on the scene. Oh, wow. You may be coward and with your back against a wall. Can I tell you that your daddy is on the way? His roar is so loud that he makes the demons of hell tremble. Woo, glory to God. And when he comes on the scene, they cower, they tuck their tails, and they run. You remind him who your daddy is. Woo, hallelujah, glory to your holy name. Thank you, Jesus, hallelujah. There's a story in the Bible. It's over in Judges, chapter 7. And it's the story of Gideon. Woo, hallelujah. He was a little fella. He says, I'm the least in my clan. What can I do? We're enslaved to the Midianites. I can't do anything. But the angel of the Lord came to him and he said, Blessed are you, mighty warrior. And Gideon says, I'm just little. I'm the least of my clan. What can I do? But the angel of the Lord said to him, Oh, let me tell you what I'm going to do for you. Go read that whole entire story. Go in there and read every time the angel of the Lord is mentioned. You underline that because that is our Savior. That is Jesus. And you read that and you underline that. And you go and you watch how that whole story progresses. The Lord tells him. He takes him down. He, Gideon gets an army together because the Lord answered his prayer. He answered his prayer of doubt. He says, Lord, if you're really going to use me, can I just can I just lay out this, this fleece of wool before you? Because, Lord, I just really can't believe that you're going to use me to set our people free. I just can't believe because I'm so worthless. I'm so insignificant. I'm going to lay this little ple fleece of wool out before you, Lord. And if, if you'll just do this for me, Lord, if you'll just make that fleece of wool wet and all the ground around it dry in the morning. I'll believe you then, Lord. I'll believe you then. So the Lord says, okay, I'll do it. And he gets up the next morning and the fleece of wool is wet and the dry uh, ground all around it is, is dry. And so he picks up that fleece of wool and it says he wrung it out and it filled up a whole bowl full of water. The Lord meant for him to know business. Well, little Gideon, he was still a little doubtful. He still just didn't quite believe that the Lord would use him to set his people free. Then he says, Lord, if you'll just give me one one more prayer, Lord. If you'll just listen to me one more time, Lord. Would you just now, I'm going to lay this out one more time. Would you let this fleece of wool be dry in the morning and all the ground around it wet? Then I'll really know, Lord. So the Lord said, it's okay. I'll do it. He didn't get mad at him for doubting. He didn't fuss at him for doubting. He didn't tell him, oh, you have little faith. He just did what he asked. 
The next morning he got up and the fleece was dry and the ground all around it was wet. So Gideon said, okay, Lord, let's do this. So he gathered him up an army. And I forget how many he said he had, but it was, you know, a couple of thousand or whatever. I don't remember. And the Lord starts whittling it down. He says, because you got too many. You got too many. Because if you have that many, then all of Israel is going to say, look what we have done. He said, I want you to whittle them down. And he tells them how to whittle them down. And by the end of the story, he's got 300 men against thousands upon thousands of Midianite soldiers. Gideon only has 300 men. And they're scared. So the Lord tells Gideon, he said, I want you to go tonight and I want you to camp out on the edge of the Midianite camp and you're going to hear some men talking. I want you to pay attention to what they're saying. So he said, and if you're scared, he tells Gideon, he said, if you're fearful, take one of your servants with you and let him go with you. So he takes one of his servants and he goes out to the corner of the camp and he's listening and he overhears two soldiers talking. One of the soldiers said, you know what? I had a dream. And he said it was a dream that uh, a, bar, a let's see a barley clay a, bar, a barley clay is that what it was barley clay came rumbling down into the camp and the reason he said barley was because barley was cheap and it was insignificant it was easy to get and it signified Gideon because it was insignificant and it said he comes tumbling down into the camp and it overtook the camp, turned all the tents up over and all this. Well, the guy that the, he was talking to, he said, that's Gideon. Gideon, the Lord has given us over into Gideon's hands. He's going to overtake us. Gideon heard that and he was filled with confidence. And he walked away from that place and the first thing he did was worship the Lord. See, the enemy knew something that Gideon didn't know. They knew who Gideon had on his side. Gideon needed to hear that. So the Lord allowed him to hear that. You have got the creator of the universe on your side. You have the savior of the world who gave his life on the cross for you. And the enemy knows it. He just wants to keep you from knowing it. And he wants you to think that you're little and insignificant and your prayers are worthless. Because he wants to tell you, I know who you really are. I know you're weak. You can't pray with the strength that you're told to pray with, all this teaching that you're getting. You can't pray with that because you're not that strong. You're not that strong. You can't fight. But the Lord says, oh, but listen, let me give you a little confidence. You tell the enemy who he really is. You tell him to back off because I'm coming. The lion of the tribe of Judah is coming and he is roaring and he is coming to your rescue and he is going to get you out of that nasty place. Mmm. Mmm. Ladies, yes, we're talking about our husband's health, and let's tie it all back up together. Our health encompasses a whole lot more than just our bodies. Our health encompasses mind, soul, spirit, body. It encompasses everything. And when our spirit and our soul and our mind is weak, we're just a target for the enemy. We've got to build up our strength through the word of God, not anything that we do on our own. It's what he teaches us in his word, the strength that comes from him alone. Please be encouraged tonight. Please be encouraged tonight. You do have strength, but it only comes from your father. And he's coming to your rescue. He is coming to get you out of that pit. He's coming to get you out of that stinky, bubbly, nasty place. And he's going to set your feet up on a rock. He's going to put a new song in your mouth. And when he does, you better sing it loud. And you better sing it clear. And you better be all kinds of foolish about it. Because our Lord is worthy of praise. Hallelujah. Glory to his holy name. Man, I love my Lord. Man, I love my Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I love you guys. Oh my goodness, don't you dare give up now. Oh, uh-uh. Don't you dare give up now.
You've come too far to turn back. Do not give up. Change is coming. I promise change is coming. I promise because I know the one who can change it. You do have a glorious marriage. Love you so much. Good night.